If you have your Bibles with you, we'd ask you to turn to Zechariah. Zechariah, that's just before Malachi. And we're going to take our text from there this morning. I don't know that I've ever <coughs> preached in uh, 27 years of ministry from this text. Uh, Zechariah chapter 1 in the first verse. Uh, Zechariah chapter 1 in the first verse. In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord into Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Idu, the prophet, saying, The Lord hath been sore displeased with your fathers. Therefore say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. Be ye not as your fathers, unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye, not, turn ye now from your evil ways and from your evil doings. But they did not hear, nor hearken unto me, saith the Lord. Your fathers were your fathers were they, and the prophets, do they live forever? But my words and my statutes, which I commanded, my servants, the prophets, did they did they not take hold of your fathers? And they returned and said, Like as the Lord of hosts thought to do so unto us, according to our ways and according to our doings, so hath he dealt with us. Upon the four and twentieth day of the eleventh month, which is the month of Sabbat, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zacharias, the son of Berchiah, the son of Idu, the prophet, saying, I saw by night, and behold, a man riding upon a red horse, and he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom, and behind them were the red were red horses speckled and white. And I said, O oh my Lord, what are these? And the angel that talked with me said unto me, I will shew thee what these be. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are they whom the Lord has sent to walk to and fro through the earth. And they answered the angel of the Lord and stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have walked to and fro through the earth, and behold, all the earth sitteth still and as it rest. And the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judea, uh, uh, excuse me, of Judah, against them that thou hast had indignation these three score and ten years? And the Lord answered the angel and talked with me with good words and with comfortable words. Amen. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your word. God, we thank you that it is in our own language and that we can receive it and that we can feast on it and that we can understand and know your thoughts and your attitudes toward man. God, we pray this morning that you would honor your word with the Holy Ghost, that you'd send it this way, that you'd fill your house with uh, your spirit. Lord, speak to the redeemed. Uh, uh, speak to the lost this morning, Lord. Show them their condition and that you might save them by your mercy and grace. And we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it is in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Now, we'll be preaching on the thought, how long has it been since you heard the Lord speak? Now, uh, in the days of Zechariah, and uh, the, the minor prophets are not necessarily in sequential order, meaning their appearance their time of ministry and their death is not in a straight line, but this is very, um, very close. Uh, it wasn't the same days of Malachi, but it was close. And and the Old Testament is about to be in, and, and the Holy Ghost and and the presence of God, and particularly the Word of God, is going to be removed for four hundred years. Now you talk about a bad spiritual shape. We we live in some rough days. But you think about not hearing from God for 400 years. That, that's a long period of silence. 
And I, I really believe that we're headed back in that direction as the days were then. I believe we'll be gone, but I, I believe, you know, a lot of people have talked about the Great Tribulation, and I do believe in a great seven-year tribulation period per, uh, uh, after the catching away of the Lord's people. But, you know, uh, in that day, they're not going to re be repentant. Uh, the way that I understand the word of God, in, in fact, they'll shake their fist at the sky and blaspheme God. Uh, so there's not no great time of repentance, even in a time of silence. You, you know what's wrong with our church is the lack of repentance. Uh, it, it doesn't have to do. It doesn't have anything to do with the word of God. The word of God hasn't changed. What has changed is our attitude towards sin. Yeah. You know what? I, I look around and I see more and more of these little hymn lines coming up and coming up and coming up. And I wonder where it's going to stop. The Lord's not pleased with that. He, goes, he, he teaches us very clearly both men and women to dress modestly. Yeah. To, to dress uh, where we got ourselves covered up. To dress where uh, we're not enticing to the to the opposite sex, and, and so we live in a day very much like in the days of Zechariah, when <clears throat> excuse me, this was all going on, uh, <clears throat> and so he begins in the eighth month. In the second year of Darius came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of uh, Berechiah, the son of Idu, the prophet, saying. Now, I want you to see that he writes, uh, he, you know, a lot of people wonder why this uh, is always beginning a minor and a major prophet, this uh, list of kings. But the reason they're given is to mark them historically mm -hmm. so that God's people can understand and know what was going on in, in the economy, uh, going on in the government, and going on in spiritually in the land of Israel at the time this occurred. Because there are benchmarkers of spirituality. And listen, we live in a in a rough day. And you know what? Uh, uh, it's just like the brother was preaching this morning. Uh, for the Holy Spirit to withdraw don't mean you have to be lost. Uh, he's not going to bless your wickedness. He's not going to bless your sin. He's not going to bless uh, uh, when you're in direct rebellion to his word. It's, it's not going to happen. And, and so we find the, the reason for these benchmarkers is so that we can understand and know the sin of Israel when this was going on. And listen, they were covered up with sin at this time. Very wicked, idolatrous generation. You know, I look around at other, and I use the word very loosely, churches about. And listen, they're, they're, uh, they're very idolatrous people. Now, the church there in Missouri, the Lord provided a wonderful building. And, and I know I know they're going to use it wisely to the service of the Lord. But, and I don't mind saying it, it was a Methodist building before they bought it out. And it had all their intricate windows in. You know what? That speaks of the Methodist's mother. That they're exactly what they're, what the, the apple don't fall far from the tree. And, you know, that's what those things are. There are benchmarks. It's so that we can see what's going on. It's so that we can tell the time in which we live. And, and so we find as, there, as, as the prophet begins to speak, he wants to say, this is what was going on in my day. Verse 2, the Lord had been sore displeased with your fathers. Now, um, part of it is because I'm a history buff, and part of it is because uh, I work with veterans every day. Uh, but we are coming up in just a few, uh, two weeks from the 70th anniversary at the ta attack at Pearl Harbor. Uh, a lot of those men, th there's more of those men than you think still alive, e even locally. And, and that war, our, our men stood up and did what was right and defended a country in a horrible, horrible day. But let me say this, our country's never been the same since then. Uh, it, it, it was a benchmark. It, it was a beginning, uh, a beginning of the end, if you will. And if you'll notice, it says 70 years. Uh, it, it, it marks it out very completely. I said 70. It was actually 80 years ago this year. And, uh, uh, and it, it was a change that this world uh, hasn't got over. 
And, and it, it will be that way until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he, he says, I'm upset, I'm disappointed, I'm displeased with your fathers. They, they've not served me. Verse 3, therefore say unto them, thus saith the Lord of hosts. Now, I think that is interesting that he was going to have to address his father's generation, the generation that's ahead of them. Now, the man's eyes, and certainly we should honor our father and mother because it teaches us that our days may be well upon the earth. But on the flip side of that, are we going to follow our, our current president? He's old enough to be my father. Uh, that I think he needs to hear from me instead of the other way around, don't you? And, and, and that was the situation in their day, that the older generation had forsaken God, and this young man, Zechariah, was going to have to stand up and say, this is the problem. The most difficult thing, Jackson, you'll ever do is pastor and say, this is the problem. Uh, thou art the man as you preach this morning. It's a very difficult thing. So his call was to address the previous generation. Verse 3. Therefore say thou unto them, thus saith the Lord of her host, turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you. Now, if you know your Bible, that is kind of repeated in, 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 the, uh, in the letter of Peter. I think it's the second one. Draw nigh unto me, and I will draw nigh unto you. And the very same thing. So I want you to see repentance, that turning, is a call of God's people. It's not, it's not a call to the damned. In fact, that's an impossibility for them. And, and, and so the redeemed, in this day, the physical nation of Israel, they were to turn to God. And if and when they turned to God, he would turn back again with blessings. Now, you want, you want your life to be better in serving the, to the Lord? Repent. Mm -hmm. you, you want your life here at New Testament to be better? Repent. And if, you want, if you want to be more powerful in the Word of God, Repent. He said, oh, Brother Larry, I haven't done anything. I know you're about like, just like me. Yeah. And nothing else, slothfulness is ever among us. And, and so we see, as Lord's people, we need to be an aggressive people to the things of the Lord. And he makes that very clear. The, the second portion of his message, be ye not as your father's. Now, that, that particular verse always hits home with me. Uh, most of you don't remember my father. My wife and my in-laws both remember dad. And uh, Adam may a little bit. Uh, but he was not a nice man. He was not a godly man. The Lord saved him by mercy, saved so as by fire at the end. But yet and still, he did not have a te the testimony he had was not good. The history that he had, I wouldn't even call it a testimony. Just the history of his life was not. And so what he called them to do, this generation was before them, you go back and address it. You go back and say, this is wrong. You go back and say, if you want to approach God, you must repent. You go back to the generation that's supposed to be wiser, and you tell them what's wrong. That, that's a very difficult thing to do. Is it not in the day which we live? Is it not a difficult thing to do and, and turn and address someone who's your elder and say, this is the problem? Therefore say thou unto them, uh, uh, excuse me, verse 4, be ye not as your fathers whom the former prophets have cried, saying, thus saith the Lord of hosts, turn ye now from your evil ways. Now, one thing that will, will block your efforts is evil ways. Now, there is nothing inanimate, and when I say that, not living, this bench, there's nothing good or bad about that bench. It can be used in a thousand different ways. We use it to take the Lord's table with. It's just a bench. It can be used to eat food off of. Uh, and there's a lot of ways it can be used. The internet is a tool. 
How do you use it? Facebook is a tool. How do you use it? Uh, what, what is your presentation on there? Your phone is a tool. How do you use it? Now, whether we, we like to kind of upgrade ourselves, but you know what you are? You're a tool. This body that I have is a tool. That's it. Uh, I can choose to use it or not use it. Yep. Um, mine had not always been the healthiest, but you know what? That's no excuse. I, I've seen people that have been old and sick since I went to high school with them. You know what that is? That's an excuse. Use what you have. Read the story this week of Lydia Baxter. Him writes, she became bedbound at 30 years old and wrote the majority of her hymns after that. See, uh, there's no getting off space. So he says, you turn to this older generation who have wasted their time, who have not served me, and, and you address that issue with them. It was a very difficult thing to do. Then he says, and your evil ways and your evil doings. Now, that, that, that is a, 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 a separate thing. A, evil ways is who you are. Uh, you know why I have black hair? That's just how it is. You know why some people are evil? They're following their nature. Now, evil ways is this. There's not one thing different about my flesh than the day the Lord saved me. Same old mess I fight all the time. In fact, if anything, I think it's getting worse as I age. But the other flip side is evil doings. Uh, just because my flesh's impulses go box somebody in the head because they make me so aggravated, I don't have to take that to do it. I, I can restrain myself. I can say, no, I'd sure like to knock him out, but I ain't going to do it because it doesn't speak well of the things of God. Evil ways and evil doings. On Facebook, you get out, oh, I'm going to clean his clock. Yeah, there's been a lot of messages I never posted. <laughs> and and better, better was I that I did. Um, and you know why? Because I read them and said, you know what? They don't speak of the things of Christ. Delete. Right? That's what, you know, once you say it, you can't take it back. Right. And, and, and so we see that both types of sin, their ways, their nature was to be limited, and then bringing it into actually saying it and doing it, it was to stop. We need to be very careful of our evil ways and our evil doings. Notice, like us, Israel imbibed this two of a kind, but they did not hear, nor hearken unto me. Now, I think here in hearken uh, takes uh, some time to look at the differences. Here is the ability to hear. If I take my hearing aids out, my hearing is very limited. Sometimes, and, and me and Donna, yesterday there was a lot of background noise uh, in those uh, stores where we bought the flooring, and I couldn't hear what she was saying to me. Uh, too much going on around me. And, but uh, that hearing physically, they could, they could, but hearing spiritually, they couldn't. Remember, all the letters to the churches, he that have an ear, let him hear. See, not everybody has a spiritual ear. The redeemed have a spiritual ear. And don't frustrate yourself with the, with the lost because they truly don't understand. They, they have no clue what you're talking about. He that have an ear, let him hear. And, and so these individuals, and I, 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 if I understand the relationship God had with the nation of Israel, they could hear. They, they were Israelis. They were born of the blood. They could hear. But then notice what it says, that they had to hear and hearken. Now, hearken means obedience. Thou shalt not kill. We hear it. I hope you hearken. I don't, I don't know if you ever knock someone off or not. You hear and you hearken. Love thy neighbor as thyself. You hear 
and you harp it. Now, that can be a very different, a difficult thing to do with just true neighbors. But what about the one that sits beside you in the pew? What about the one you meet in the grocery line? Hearken, listen, bring it into your life. And you know, I don't think a lot of times we do that. We don't hearken. We hear it, and we know certainly what the scriptures teach, but we don't bring it into an active part of our life where we're actually doing what the Word of God says. We don't hearken. We don't obey. Verse 5, your fathers, where are they? Now, I'd have to say some of them were probably dead. Where are they? Where are your fathers? Some of them were serving, and some of them were not. Some were obedient, and some were not. So I, I really believe, why, why, would, why would the Lord inspire Zechariah to do this? You know what? You need to look at people. Now, I've been a nurse most of my life. The first thing in nursing, assess your patient. Look at them, see what's going on with them. Now, and, and this shows how, and I, I mean, I, I, I just shook my head and walked away. Uh, I, I was working the other day, and uh, I went to each of my residents' room just to take a glance, and one of the techs came up to me and goes, why do you do that? I'm like, well, I want to see if they're here, and I want to make sure they're breathing, right? I want to look around. You know what? I don't think that we do much of that today in a spiritual sense, do we? When we see people hurting, do we go to them? When you see someone angry, do you, do you immediately get angry back? Or do we go to them? Do we look things over? He says, look at the situation for what it is. Look, uh, see how God's people are doing. See who's following. See who's not. Hey, see who's troubled. See who's, who things are going well. Where are they? And the prophets? Do they live forever? No, they die. Preachers come, preachers go. The word says the same. Verse 6, but my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they, did they not take hold of your fathers? Ask you this. When did the word of God take hold of you? Or even has it yet? When the word of God takes hold of you, it has meaning. When the word of God, or, you know, and so oh, I've always loved the word of God. Well, I know you didn't until the Lord saved you. Uh, but, it says, take hold. You know, you know when it took hold of me? Different times. I've read some scriptures in that book, and uh, time and time and time again, like, what does that mean? And then one day, it took hold of me. You know, have you ever thought there's people that live the entirety of their life, and not one verse ever takes hold of them? Yeah. That's a pretty lonesome life, isn't it? Yeah. That, that's a pretty difficult life to live. And, and, and so uh, the prophet asks this, and you know, that's a question that you have to answer for yourself. I can't answer that for you. <laughs> I have to say for the generation that Zechariah was referring to, the parents of that day, it didn't take hold. You know, uh, people who say they're saved and act like they're lost, all I can say, old saying go, it didn't take hold. That's where this, that's where that old saying comes from. And I have to agree. You know, uh, I'm not, I'm not convinced by somebody saying a prayer. I, I'm not convinced by going through a routine. I'm not convinced by them even saying the right words. I'm convinced by time. I'm convinced by time. And, and, and so we see then that uh, in the days of Zechariah, he asked about this former generation. He says, did it really happen? Did they hearken unto me? Did, did they listen? And unfortunately, the, the answer was no. Ver, the rest of verse 6, and they returned and said, like as the Lord of hosts thought to do, of hosts thought to do unto us, 
according to our ways and according to our doings, so have he dealt with us. Now, in other words, he says, the way the Lord God did to us, we're going to do to him. The way that he treated us, the way we treated him, he's treated us. And you know what? In a lot of ways, they were being honest. They left God, and God left them. Now, that's not, that, that's not good old cartwheel Baptist preaching, but it's true. If you look like you're in misery, what I have found is you're pretty much in misery. Yeah. Yeah. Whether you're saved or lost, brother, preach so well on the on, on David today. David, the Bible says, was a man after God's own heart. He got involved in sin, so it says, I believe in the 71st Psalm that he wept, but he wept so much his couch or his bed was wet. See, that can happen to us. Just because you're saved don't mean that you're enjoying life. It does mean you can, but it doesn't mean you are. And, and, and so we find that uh, in the days of Zechariah, the entirety of that former generation was a, was a generation that forgot God. Verse 7, upon the four and twentieth day of the eleventh month, which is the month of Sebat, in, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berchiah, Ber the son of Idu, the prophet, saying, in other words, he's going to have to be consistent in his ministry. He got one message, he delivered it, it wasn't pleasant, it wasn't a cartwheel message, now he's getting another one. I saw by night, and behold, a man came riding upon a red horse, and he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom, and behind him were red horses speckled and white. Now, I want you to see what you see, and the Lord God gives him an explanation by the angel in a, in a moment, but he, he saw this vision, and he was attentive to it. Now, if, if my understanding is correct, uh, a myrtle tree, and I think if, if I understand correctly, we call them crepe myrtle here, very same tree, and we all know that blooms in May, or May. And so he's having this, this dream in the month of Sabbath. So this is a futuristic dream, at least by six months. And uh, he, he, he's looking and seeing what's ahead. Now, we're not prophets today in the modern day, but I believe I can see what's ahead, don't you? But you know what? There's parts that I don't see ahead. There's things that I don't yet understand. In, in the days when y'all were young, did y'all ever think that you could literally be typing and someone see it instantly on the other side of the world? That was beyond our scope of thinking. E even in my lifetime, I remember one computer down in the business department in all of Stewart County High when me and Donna was over there, and I remember taking computer sciences and thinking, man, this is gonna be cool. And I remember Coach Carson going, I don't know why I'm teaching this class. He says, I don't know anything about computers. And we all sat down and we learned it together. And today, even as I speak right now, it's broadcasting. So I don't think he saw everything, but he saw the spiritual condition, did he not? He saw how things were going to go downhill. And more than that, he saw judgment. You know what? Judgment is coming. Judgment, I can't say how bad it's going to get. And, and you know the computers we now use, they may be dinosaurs in 10 years. I can't say what's coming on that forefront, but I can tell you this of a certainty, Christ is coming. And we're going to be caught away. Yeah. We're going to be home to be with the Lord. And, and, and so we see that uh, Zechariah sees this unusual vision and he sees these people uh, are, are these beasts and, and that appeared to be horses and he was faithful to that testimony. Verse 9, Then said I, O Lord, uh, what are these? And the angel talked with me and said unto me, I will shew thee what these be. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, these are they whom the Lord has sent to walk to and fro through the earth. 
Now, it's our job, it's our responsibility, those of us who are redeemed, to walk to and fro in the earth. That's our responsibility. And when you meet somebody, you say, have you heard of the man named Jesus? Have you heard of the, of the genuine saving power of the Lord God? Have you met him along the way? That's our responsibility. And you know what? We can't be choosy with that. You don't know who the elect are. You keep preaching. You, you keep saying, hey, you know what? God, the Lord sure been good to me. And, and if that's all you can say, you continue to do that. And uh, the other flip side of that, who else is walking to and fro in the earth and up and down in it? Satan. Satan. So you're going to have some accompaniment, aren't you? You're going to have an opposer. But blessed be the name of the Lord. You know, don't give him too much credit. The Bible says this, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. In other words, he's not going to waste time That's on right. a faithful Christian. He'll find, he'll find someone like the shape that David was in and do that. So it is a very deliberate act if we're faithful. It, it, it's not something that happens by accident. You know what? As a young pastor, I used to get stressed out over people that were not following the Word of God. Listen, I don't stress out no more. That's between him, them and the Almighty. I will give them a warning as a good under-shepherd should, and I'll leave it there. That's what we need to do. And, and so the, this person that was walking among the myrtle trees and walking up and down in the earth ought to be us. We ought to be the ones preaching and teaching and spreading the gospel and not just preaching men. Ver the second part of verse 10, they, these are they whom the Lord sent to walk to and fro through the earth. Verse 11, and they answered the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees and said, we have walked to and fro, fro through the earth and beyond and behold all the earth sitteth still and is at rest so instead of god's people walking to and fro in the earth they were sitting still they were doing nothing they weren't accomplishing anything for the cause of christ they weren't preaching they they weren't listening now, one thing I learned about teaching the years I taught was active listening. And you know what? I learned how to read it just like that book. When you're checked out, boy, I know it. And when you're not checked out and you're entrenched, I know that too. You ever heard a boring sermon and, you know, a yawn sermon? You have to get up and go to the bathroom six times? Hey, I've been there. I, I know all about it. Uh, but, we ought to be listening. Or there's something there for us. But nobody was doing anything. You know, do you, do you not believe that that's the day which we live where no one is doing anything? Uh, I rejoice in the work at Paris because at least someone is doing something. Uh, look about our churches today. They're dwindling. <laughs> They're drying up on the vine. You know why? It, it, it's because no one is doing anything. So these prophets, these beings, these angels, whatever these were, sitting in the crate portal and said, we looked everywhere and no one's doing anything. That's a very scary time to live. You know what? With lost children myself, I want somebody to be doing something to you. Now, this is the flip side to that. You know what? There is always going to be the work of Satan going on. He is more faithful than we. He's more active than we. And he's always going to be doing something. Look at these big so-called churches today. You know what? They're no more than entertainment. That's all they are. We, but you know what? You know why they're growing? Because they're doing something. Mm -hmm. It's not just the depravity of man. Listen, those things didn't mushroom on their own. There's people out there going, come to church. You just use leaf, loosely. 
Uh, we got something going on down there. Uh, we have 80s rock music with new, with new words to it. Come and see. And you know what? They do. They do come and see. So surely the people of God can do the same thing. Surely we as the Lord's true church in the days in which we live, surely we can get out and do the very same thing to those that, are, that stand outside the faith. Verse 12, And the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long wilt thou have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah against which thou hast indignation? These three score and ten years? Again, that's seven years. Think about it. 70 years ago, 1951, most of us weren't even here. 1951, you know what the hallmark was? Man went to work, mama stayed home and kept the house. And they had a good life. But now, just a little bit after this, the 1960s dawned. You know, you know what led to women going to work? People being unsatisfied. Now, it wasn't that they needed anything more. They wanted more. And think about that too. They're, they're 10 years, 15 years out. From the great from the Second World War ending. And you know what most of them, many of them hadn't done since they got but gone got back, the men particularly. They might have been church. All of us remember the generation where mama took them to church and daddy stayed at home. Mm -hmm. We're seeing the results of that. Mm -hmm. And then after that generation, my generation. You went on holidays, by and large. And now we've risen up a generation, the Bible says, that knew not God. Yeah. And why don't they know him? They've never been around him. So the, the prophet says, are you going to have mercy that long? Are you going to give them the, the amount of 70 years? Are you going to, are you going to steal your judgment until that's come to pass? Then notice what he says. And the Lord answered the angel that talked with me with good words and comfortable words. This book before us is good and comfortable, is it not? You see the world falling apart at its singing. Yeah. You see empty shelves on the grocery store. You, you, uh, you see things that you really never thought you'd live to see. Good and comfortable words right here. You know, uh, and I preach on it a lot, men marrying women, and I mean, men marrying men, and women marrying women. You know, the best to understand that was happening in the days of Sodom. That's nothing new. It's, it's deplorable to us, because we lived in a nation that restricted it so long, but that is the nature of men. Read Romans chapter 1 if you don't believe that. And, and, and so he says, I was comforted by what the angels had to say. Verse 14, so the angel that communed with me said unto me, Cry thou, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem for Zion, and for Zion with a great jealousy. Now, jealous means when uh, you there's, there's an opponent uh, there is someone else vying for affection and isn't it a wonderful thing that the Lord God of heaven is jealous of his people uh, and, and to be jealous there has to be an adversary there has to be someone else that wants the affection too and that's Satan himself that, that, that's the bulk of false doctrine they, that is the person that is the thing he's jealous with now uh, after 33 plus years, I kind of got, but you know what? And this is crazy, and I laugh at myself. And I saw his sister the other day. I used to be jealous of Darren. Uh, I can't even remember his last name. Yeah, because 
he could sit, he played the piano, sort of. <laughs> and uh, I thought him and uh, Donna had a, you know, was kind of boyfriend and girlfriend. And I didn't like, I didn't like Darren. <laughs> and you know why? Because I was jealous. I was jealous of the woman I loved. And you know what? That's a good thing. Thing helped me out. I was better looking at Darren. <laughs> and, and, and so uh, we see then that that's the kind of love that God had for us. He has it for Israel. He has it for his church. And that was what was a comfort to Zechariah the prophet. And because he should have been comforted by that, he said, cry, preach. Tell them that, that I still love them. Tell them that they're still mine. Tell them that I desire them. Verse 18, then lifted I up mine eyes and saw, behold, four horns. And I saw, and I said unto the angel that talked with me, what be these? And he answered me, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Now, last thing I'm going to say, you be very careful of the four horns. Now, I've read this, and I honestly don't know which four horns there was, but I can tell you four that I know about. Number one is false salvation. If the salvation you're trusting don't drive you to Christ, forget about it. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. The second one is false religion. And listen, Satan is too wise to approach a nation like America with Satanism. He's going to give you a false Christ. He's going to give you a Christ that's trying to save you. Well, I never know Christ trying anything that he didn't accomplish, did you? So that, that, that's another one of these horns. Another horn that's out there and it's mushrooming. There is no God. You know, you know why they want to believe that? If there's no God, there's no accountability. Right. They're, they're not worried about the existence of God. They're truly not. They're worried about being accountable unto Him. And the last horn that we see in the church age is the lack of love. You know what motivates people to spread the gospel? Love. And not just the fearfulness of hell, which is very much a reality, but you love them. You, you're interested in them. You're concerned about their eternity. We need to be there, do we not? When people approach me about redemption, I point them to the scriptures. And, and in the Armenian realm, they run you down there and repeat a prayer. But all I can say is, seek you the Lord when you do He's the answer to your sin. And that's all we can do. You know, that puts preachers... <laughs> by, you, you know why they expect us to get them to say a prayer? That's false doctrine. It's easy to sell. It's easy to encourage people. It's one of the horns that sticks out. And the very same thing that wiped Israel out. All I can say is trust you the Lord. That's all I can tell. So I ask you this morning, where are you at? I believe nationally we can see that the United States is very much as it was in the day of Zechariah. And that there's not... Uh, there's not a lot of hope nationally unless God intervenes and unless he, unless he does a marvelous and wonderful work. But spiritually, we can still be faithful. Spiritually, we can preach the gospel that the Bible teaches and not what the world is sold out to be the gospel. Spiritually, we can be fed on the man. You know, you know what the thing about man was? You couldn't stow it. Had to be fresh every day. We need that, do we not? Every day. You know what? We come here twice a week. We look into the Word of God and we hope to be fed. But you can't go on that. Mm -hmm. I don't know about y'all, but typically I eat three times a day. Do you nurture your inner man that much? Do you get in that Word? Do you dig around in it? Uh, 
You bring what were you trying to convey? What people were you talking to? When were you talking to them? And what did you say? We need that from the Word of God, do we not?